Hi, my name is Andre Cohen, and I want to say thank you so much for joining us here at AM Horizons, where we work to help you freedom. Now, first of all, uh, as we go into these, these trainings, uh, there are some things that you need to, to understand about our methods and how we work. First of all, we understand that people learn, change, and grow. As they go through their lives, they, they learn how to uh, adapt to their environments, they learn how to become more effective individuals, and how to become better people. Ultimately, what we also understand is that all human behavior is goal-directed that no matter where we come from, everything that we do is designed to help us reach and accomplish our goals. The next thing we understand and we, we want to explore as you engage in this training with us is the idea that um, no matter what someone does, they do it because it makes sense to them, even if it does not make sense to you. And lastly, what's important for you to realize uh, as, as we go through these training tools and these training modules is that um, attitude is a response to a goal. And typically what, what people say or what people think about an attitude is that an attitude is some kind of emotional response to, um, to either getting what you want or being denied what you want. And what I'd like to offer you is that uh, attitude is that and much, much more. And it is also much, much less, all right? So uh, I want to spend some time talking about this concept of, of attitude. First of all, let me just share with you that my, uh, my father was my pastor. And so I am a preacher's kid. My dad was my pastor. And so on Sundays, we would go to church from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. We'd stop at 3 o'clock for chicken, not because we were black, but because chicken is delicious. So I knew that Sunday was church all day. Now, on, uh, on Friday night, I'd ask my dad for the car, and because my dad loves me, what does he say? He says yes, because he wants me to be happy. And so I, uh, I get the car, I go hang out with my friends, I put gasoline in the car, I come back home before curfew, and what does my dad say about my attitude? He says that I have a good attitude. Consequently, what do I say about my dad's attitude? I also say that my father has a good attitude. So Sunday comes along, and, and, um, and so I'm preparing for church, and I get a phone call from my best friend, Dexter. And Dexter says, Andre, can you pick me up for the movies at 1230? Now, what do I know about church on Sunday? I have church all day. But I'm thinking, Jesus is my friend. You know, he, he can hook a brother up, right? And so I, I go to my father and I say, Dad, can I borrow the car? And what does my dad say to me? He says no. And not only does he say no, but he gives me a lecture about how I'm leading people to hell, right? So every negative consequence in my home, the ultimate consequence was that you were going to hell. And either you could go on your own or my parents would be more than happy to show you the way. So, uh, so I, I, I say that my father has what kind of attitude? I say that he has a negative attitude, and consequently, he, what does he say about my attitude? That my attitude is also negative, all right? So I have a bad attitude, my father has a bad attitude. However, on Friday night, I had a good attitude, and my father also had a good attitude. So what is it that actually determines or drives or creates one's attitude? It is ultimately the goal. I don't know if you've known teenagers, if you've been around teenagers, or if you've ever been a teenager yourself. But one of the things that you, you know about teenagers is that when they get what they want, it is all, almost as if they're a cuddly cat, right? I mean, they, they get up next to you and they want to cuddle, and, and sometimes you'll see like little drool coming out of, uh, that's my cat, sorry, right? But, but, but teenagers are like that, but when they're denied access to what they want or, or, or they can't get what it is that they desire, then they become this cold, nasty um, kind of person that you, you just kind of wonder, do I know you? Who are you, right? And so if, if I'm a person that is a helper, if I'm a person that's, that, that, that is uh, trying to aid someone in accomplishing uh, their goals or trying to change their attitude, the first thing I must understand is when I encounter someone with a bad or a negative attitude, I know one thing about them for sure, that they are not 
reaching what? Their goal. And so the goal becomes an, an important and crucial part of helping them to, to, to change how they respond and how they see the world. To ultimately change their attitude, I must help them change their goal. Now, here's the, the part that we mostly get stuck on, particularly those of us who are adults and, and we work with ch children. We, we want them to change their affect. We want them to change their behavior in some kind of way, when in actuality, what we need for them to do is to change their goal. Now, when I encounter someone with a bad attitude, I have two responses. The easiest to help them uh, have a good attitude, the easiest thing for, the, for me to do is to help them get what it is that they want. And then they will have a good attitude, right? So that's the, the, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is this. What if the, the, the goal that they have, uh, the thing that they're trying to accomplish, they don't have the resources for, they don't have the ability to do it, or it's just not playing good for them? Then what becomes my role as a helper to this individual? My role then becomes a, a, a person that becomes a facilitator to help them find a new goal. And so when you encounter someone with a bad attitude, you have two responsibilities. One is to help them achieve their goal, if that's possible. Or secondly, to help them find or change their goal. So I want to talk a little bit about this concept of diversity, because uh, I don't know about you, but if you ask 100 people what diversity is, you'll get 100 answers, right? Um, and so when we talk about diversity, we, we often talk about the, the emotional response to, to diversity, or we talk about um, you know, how it makes us feel or, or not feel, how we're included or, or left out. And, um, and, and so th I have a problem with this concept of diversity as it's been played out in the past. And I want to say, I want to thank my four parents. I want to thank for those men and women who, uh, who fought for my right to vote and my right to, to shop anywhere that I want. But we need a new paradigm for diversity. And so part of that new paradigm of diversity requires us to, to look at those old concepts concepts. And so if I ask 100 people, I would get 100 answers. And if I'm a teacher and I give a test to a, to a group of students and each one of my students gives me a different answer, then the problem isn't with the students. The problem is with me. And so if people can give us different definitions of what diversity is, it, it's obvious that as teachers, as people who have worked with these concepts, that we haven't necessarily done a good job or that, the, that it's changed in such a way that, that we really can't identify what it is uh, in an articulate manner that we're trying to work on. And so I want to talk about this, this concept of diversity, but I want to talk first about what diversity is not. All right? I want to talk about what diversity is not. And diversity is not political correctness, all right? Diversity, again, is not political correctness. Um, we did a really good job in the 1980s and 1990s trying to get people to um, not say stupid stuff. However, 
Political correctness has gotten so obtuse, it's gotten so far from our original goal that it has actually become a joke. It, it, it's a joke because a janitor is no longer a janitor. They are a custodial engineer. Now, I understand that we, we want and need to, um, you know, create professionalism in our uh, in our spheres of influence and that makes sense but when I can't have a conversation about uh, a person in my office or I don't know what the correct term is then it's become um, pretty complicated and not very useful in in helping me uh, to, to communicate and one of the things that that I found I, I was in a training once and uh, a woman stood up and she said Andre I just want to know why all the colored people are moving into my neighborhood. And that as she stood up and she said those, those words, the audience you know, kind of looked back and they were like, <gasps> and then uh, the other half of the audience that, that wasn't you know, inhaling <gasps> in surprise uh, had this look on their faces like, Andre, get her, get her. I know you're gonna get her because you're the diversity trainer, get her, because she was wrong. And so as I looked at this woman, one of the things that I noticed when I looked at her, it was very clear that she did not have a lot of stamps in her passport. It was clear that she hadn't gone to the Ivy League schools and had all of this, uh, this profound education. And so what I saw was a woman who had a question and she was asking me to answer that question. And so what I did for her was something that I do all the time. I looked her straight in the face, and I only had one responsibility to this woman, and that was to answer her question. Because there are other people in the room who, who, who had that same kind of question, who, who have these kind of conversations, but weren't brave enough to stand up and actually ask the question. And so, uh, so, so I honored her by, by answering her question. Because I've also been in contact with people who have had the right words, who, who, who speak the king's English. They know the right things to say. But as they're speaking to you, your skin just crawls with disgust. Because you can hear and feel the darkness in their heart. So diversity is not about political correctness. It's also not about black and white. And when I talk about black and white, I mean not just the racial construct that we've invented, but also the, the metaphor of being absolutes, that it's about being absolutely correct or absolutely wrong. And so what I would say is that diversity is about that, that gray area that we try to find um, how we can connect and, and work with one another. Diversity is also not about blame, fault, or guilt. Oftentimes, when people have the conversations about diversity, they are moved either by blame or shame or fault or guilt. And, and, and so I ask this question, um, does your car have blind spots? And typically, the answer is yes, that your car does have blind spots. And it's typically, you know, to your left and right on your over your shoulders. Sometimes it's in the back. Um, you, you have blind spots all over the place. And are those blind spots your fault? And my answer to that would also be no, it's not your fault. However, it is your responsibility. And so although we did not create the, 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 the situations that we're in, we did not create the problems, we didn't create racism or sexism, uh, but we did inherit that as something that has become our responsibility to do something about. And so diversity is not about, um, it's not about political correctness, it's not about uh, black and white, it's not about uh, blame, fault, or guilt, and it's not therapy. A lot of times people get into diversity trainings, they get into diversity discussions, and um, the trainers themselves tout themselves as being you know, professional therapists and that it wasn't an effective session unless I was able to get someone to cry or if someone wasn't able to express their, um, all of their you know, emotional baggage in, in, in the session. And so I would say that diversity training is not about therapy. Um, and, and it's also not about meritocracy. And meritocracy is the concept that if you work hard enough, you can be just like me. Now, what's the problem with meritocracy? Well, on, on, on its surface, it sounds like a really good idea that if everyone just worked and, and did their part, we could all share in the same bounty. 
but the truth of the matter is this, that we don't all start off the same and we have different abilities and, and different things that we're responsible for. So, you know, working hard enough is not always the answer. Some of the hardest working people that I know are poor people. And some of the, uh, the, the, the folks that don't work so hard are people of means or, or with wealth. And so um, meritocracy is not the answer. So what is the answer? The answer is very simple, that diversity is not about uh, black and white. It is not about, you know, uh, political correctness. It's not about blame, fault, and guilt. And lastly, diversity is not about tolerance. Now, when I say diversity is not about tolerance, people get really nervous because there are websites, there are museums dedicated, there are books. Um, we've taught our kids about tolerance, and so we, we expect that they will be tolerant. But what we fail to realize is that um, tolerance means to put up with something, right? And, and so I tell this joke, and, and, and it is truly a joke, that my, my brother-in-law comes to visit with his, uh, with his family, and my, my, uh, with my sister and, and their kids, and I tolerate that dude. And why do I tolerate them? And typically, you know, people come up with the answers that you tolerate him because you love your sister. You tolerate him because... Um, you love your nieces and nephews because he's your brother-in-law and, and all that. And I, I want to tell you the truth about that joke, which is that um, I tolerate my brother-in-law or I tolerate people in my life because I know when they will leave. I know when they'll leave. Right. And so um, when we talk about tolerance, what we what we subject, what we suggest on a subconscious level is that I will put up with this group of immigrants. I will put up with this uh, with these women. I will put up with these various situations because I know ultimately they will leave. But I have to say, folks, if we look at our, our culture and we look at um, our, our communities, are our communities getting less diverse? Are our human relations getting less complicated? And my answer would be no. And so as we think about what diversity is, what I'd like to offer you is a, a different way or a better way to think about diversity. And so, you know, the old ways of thinking about diversity in terms of, you know, being culturally, um, being politically correct or, um, you know, think of it, thinking of it in black and white terms, um, looking at diversity as, you know, as, you know, meritocracy, that if people work hard enough or even thinking about diversity as tolerance has not taken us to the next level. And so what I'd like to give you is a way of thinking, a way of being, a way of interacting that, that transcends um, this, this racial or political construct that we've developed and designed for ourselves. And so what I'd like for you to think about is I'd like for you to think about this particular statement and a new way of looking at diversity. And it's very simply this, that there is dignity and honor in being human. And so when we look at that, that, that statement at a, at a deeper level, if we go beyond the, the superficial words that, that in, 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 in clauses and phrases that are, are, are entangled in that, we can dissect and really look at how we are to live our lives and, and what is at the core of what diversity efforts should be offering us. And so when you think about the word uh, dignity, what comes to mind? Um, when I, I look around the city, the, the, the metro area in which I live, one of the things that I notice or one of the, the, the groups of people that I see is I often see people holding up cardboard signs that say, will work for or need help with. And typically, what do those people want? They want money. That's what they want. What do you think I give those individuals? I'm not giving up any cash, right? Um, so what I give them is I give them dignity. And how do I give them dignity? Well, dignity, dignity first says that I have the ability to engage someone at the level that they, um, where I find them. That how they live and what they do is more important 
uh, than what I think they should do. I accept people for where they are. And so when I see those individuals with those signs, I meet them and I, I try to find out their story. I try to have a conversation with them about where they're, they're coming from. And if I can get them resources later, I, I try to do that. So that's the, the, the first thing about what diversity means, right? So there is dignity and honor and being human. And so when we talk about the word honor, what does honor mean? Honor is very simply the, uh, the ability to hold respect in a high level, in, in, in a high level of, um, of respect. So dignity is meeting people where they are. Uh, honor is having a high level of respect for individuals. And in our society, who have we said that we should give honor to? Typically, we give honor to men and women who have done things on our behalf that we could not do for ourselves, for our parents and our grandparents, for senior citizens, for, for men and women who have fought in armed services. We give them high levels of respect. And next, so there is dignity, there is honor, and being human. What I'd like for you to ask yourself, um, and I want you to you know, raise your hand if you can answer yes to these next two questions. Raise your hand if you have either passed a test or you have uh, purchased a ticket that has allowed you to be born on this planet. If you can say yes to either one of those questions, please raise your hand. The truth of the matter is none of us have brought ourselves here. We've all accepted an invitation. I don't like to think about how that invitation came. That's disgusting. But we accepted an invitation. And it's our job to figure out what our purpose is. Why were we selected out of all of the, um, our brothers and sisters in, 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 our, in our parents' wombs? Why were we selected? What, what is the purpose that we are to serve? How is the world better because I have existed? And so there is dignity. There is honor in being. And lastly is the word human. And when I look at the word human, I find something very interesting. What I find is that it has two definitions. The first definition deals with um, our anatomy. Human being, having uh, two legs, being a, a biped, if you will, having opposable thumbs, a big brain, and a belly button. If you ever encounter a person without a belly button, be concerned, right? So human having a big brain, a belly button, opposable thumbs, walking on two legs, knowing that you know, being homo sapien sapien, the one who knows that they know that they exist. Human. But human also has a second definition. And that is that of an adjective. And what do adjectives do? Adjectives describe the noun. So there are certain kinds of ways we are supposed to be that exemplify what it means to be human. And so when we talk about this concept of, of humanity, what it means to be human, being that biped, um, you know, having opposable thumbs, having a big brain, knowing that you know that you exist, how are you supposed to be human? What is it that we teach our, the, the, the smallest of our, our human relatives, our, our nieces and nephews, our babies, our children? What do we teach them about what it means to be human? And I want you to think about what does it mean to be human when we are giving dignity, honor, and, and being human? Now, one of the things that I often hear people say is that uh, I can't give someone dignity because they have to earn it. Or I can't give someone honor because they haven't earned it. And, and what I would like to say to you is that that's probably the most asinine, craziest, uh, narcissistic thing I have heard in a very long time. Because one of the things that, that I've learned as a, as a high school teacher is that I can't, or my students couldn't, or people can't, earn your respect. Have you ever heard someone say that? You know, you have to earn my respect. And what I would offer to you is that respect can never be earned. It can never be earned.
There is dignity and honor in being human. Oftentimes when we talk about diversity, we often talk about it in very esoteric ways. We talk about it in very emotional ways. But typically we never talk about what is the core and the root of what we currently call diversity. So what is dignity? Dignity implies that there is a self-pride as well as a pride that is exuded and offered to other people. So as a part of diversity, there is dignity. There is also honor. Oftentimes people confuse honor with, uh, with respect. But honor is respecting at a very high level. Dignity, honor, and respect. There is dignity and honor in being human. What does it mean to be? None of us have done anything to be here on this planet. So we're not more worthy or less worthy than anyone else. We're just here to learn about how to be humans. And lastly, there is dignity and honor in being human. What does it mean to be human? Well, if we look up in the dictionary, we find something very interesting. That there are two definitions for the word human. One being the noun, uh, having thumbs, having a big brain and walking on two legs. Human. But there's also the adjective of being human that describes how we should exist. The things we should do, the ways in which we should interact with each other. There is dignity and honor in being human. So we just talked about the fact that there's dignity and honor in being human. And one of the things that I, I'd like for us to, to really explore in greater depth is this concept that, um, that we oftentimes feel that people have to earn uh, dignity and honor in being human, or, or they have to earn our respect. And what I like to say is that it's, it's very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to actually earn someone's respect. Because respect isn't something that you can 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 earn. Um, I recall as a as a small child being uh, infatuated with this young lady named Ruthie at church, and so uh, Ruthie one day uh, I was you know trying to flirt with her or, or get in good with her, and and so I, uh, I I went up to Ruthie and she said, Andre, if you liked me, you would do A B C, and so being a, a kid that was really enthralled with this woman or this young girl at the time, uh, I did A, B, and C. And so um, I, after accomplishing those things, uh, she looks at me and she says, well, Andre, if you really, really loved me, you would do C, D, and E. And so being the, the kid that I am, I did those things as well. And after I accomplished those things, I just knew that I would, you know, get her attention. I'd be at the center of, uh, of her life, if you will. And uh, she had another set of chores for me to do. And at that point, I realized that there was nothing that I could really do to earn her infatuation, her, her liking me. And so, um, as I grew older, it, it really, that, that story really resonated with me, or it really rang true for me as I thought about how um, you involve yourself with relationships with, with other folks. And when we talk about this idea of respect, uh, respect can never be earned. It is something that has to be given. And the reason that we can't earn it is because that the target is always shifting and moving depending on the person who we're trying to get that to. And the most interesting part about this is that I have to give dignity and honor to people who have not earned it. Um, it's easy for me to, to give dignity and honor in, in, in being human, give respect to, give love to, give uh, appreciation to people who are giving it back to me. That's the easy part. 
But the difficult part and the, the thing that makes uh, those of us who are change agents special is that we can give people dignity and honor and being human. We can give them respect. We can give them love. We can give them admiration, not because they've earned it, but because that's what's inside of us. It's very difficult for, for any individual to give something that they don't have for themselves. So if I don't have uh, respect for myself, it's difficult for me to give respect to someone else. If I don't have love in, in, inside of me and, and I haven't experienced love, I can't give that experience of love to someone else. And so when we talk about this concept of dignity and honor and being human, we have to give that in spite of how people act because that's what's in us. Now, I, I hear many of you saying, that's all cool, Andre, that, that, that's great that you say that. But um, what I would encourage you to, to also think about is this one simple fact, because a number of people, as you try to, to live your life this way, as you try to engage people this way, people will say to you, um, why did you let that interaction happen like that? You shouldn't take that. Don't be a doormat. Have you ever heard someone say that? Don't be a doormat. Don't let people walk all over you. Now, it becomes easy to fall for that trick. And what, what people don't typically understand or that what they don't explore, what they don't talk about, is that in that statement, you have created you as the center of the universe. That, that, that interaction that you had with someone else has just now become all about you. Now, I also want you to, to realize and to think about this for, for just a second, that a doormat does have purpose. And, and what's the purpose of a doormat? Um, in, in some cases, it is, in fact, to wipe your feet off, to get the dirt off of, off of your shoes before you enter into someone's home. It, it's also used as a tool to welcome people into an environment, right? So, so a, a doormat does have a purpose. But I would also say that uh, th there are some verbs and, and, and adjectives that, that go with a doormat that we can apply to, to other things. And, and so I would also say that, you know, the, the, the verbs that we do on a doormat, we can also do on a bridge. And what's the difference between a doormat and a bridge? Uh, a doormat takes you to a limited place, but uh, a bridge actually expands your ability to get from where you are to where you want to go. And all too often, we want to do the right thing or we want to be right, but not do the right thing. And so we oftentimes don't take opportunities to be bridges because we're concerned about being walked over as a mat. But I have to tell you, to get from here to there as a bridge, people have to walk over you. They may stomp your feet, but as long as you keep in your mind that you are serving a purpose, then you actually serve a purpose. And lastly, this is the last story I want to share with you today because it's ex extremely important that we understand how to walk this stuff out. And so I, I live in a, in a community that's not a very diverse community. And so I'm, I'm hanging out um, at a restaurant and uh, it's about 1030 in the morning and, and an individual um, is, is already there. He's, he's obviously been there for most of the morning. I mean, it's 1030, so he couldn't have been there too long, but he's already drunk. He's uh, he's slurred, he has slurred, slurred speech. He's his you know his face is red. I mean, it's just he, the guy's just a mess. And so I I take note of him. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I know where everybody is and, and all that kind of stuff. So I make my, um, I make my order. I, I have them, you know, create my lunch for me so that so that I can take it on my journey for the day. And so um, I, I order from the menu, I fold the menu, give it back to the bar staff, and the guy at the end of the bar, the drunk guy, has moved from the end of the bar and sat right next to me. And I know you know what I'm thinking, like, oh my goodness. Because first of all, I'm not afraid of, of drunk people, but they are unpredictable. And so, you know, we sit there and we're, uh, we're talking and we're having conversation. And so he leans over to me and he says, I don't like the N word. Now he said the real word. He didn't say my edited version of it. You know, the, the, the word that your grandparents used to talk about Brazil nuts. Yeah. If you know what I'm talking about, you do. And if not, I'm not passing out fruit. All right. Um, so, so he says, I don't like the, the, the N word. And so I, I just kind of take a breath back and I do what any good Minnesotan would do. And I try to change the subject. So I started talking about something else, but something in my spirit said, go back to that, go back and talk about uh, what he, what he was, what he was talking about. And so I said, sir, well, when you use that word, what are you, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm talking about people who are on welfare. I'm talking about people who are ghetto, who are uneducated, who, you know, don't know how to speak well. And, um, and I said, huh, I said, well, do you know any white people who fit that description? And he looks at me and he says, yeah. And I said, okay, that, that, that's cool. How about the, um, let's talk about baseball. And so we started talking about baseball and, and all this other stuff. And then he comes back to me and he says, um, man, I don't like the N word, but I like you. And so now I'm really, I'm like shocked and surprised. I'm not quite sure what to do with that information. But um, I, I say, sir, well, what is it about me that you like? What is it about me that you think is so special or unique? And he said, well, you are, you know, you're articulate. You have a good head on your shoulders. You, you make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I, I can communicate with you. You seem like a cool guy. And I said, well, that's all, that's all well and good. But what if, what if all the people that you've met all the people who you think look like me, all the people who you've encountered that you think are that N-word were idiots. What if all of them were idiots? And all of the people that you haven't met yet are just like me. And he looks at me and he says, I got to pee. So he stumbles off into the restroom. I'm like, I haven't had to get into a fight. You know, there's there's nothing going on. Um, you know, this this guy is just crazy. But let me get out of here. So I try to get my um, I pay for my check. I, I've got my receipt. I'm headed towards the door. And guess who meets me at the door? You bet it. You got it. It's the guy from the bar. But he looks a little bit different. His hair's combed over to the side. He's got water driplets coming off his, his face. And he has a damp towel in his hand. And he reaches out to me and he says, I raise chickens. If you ever need fresh eggs, give me a call. And he hands me the napkin. I take the napkin. I go my way and he goes his way. What happened? I was able to show this man dignity and honor in being human. Would you have blamed me if, if I had given that guy a piece of my mind? He called me a dirty, nasty name. I shouldn't have to take that. If I had given him a piece of my mind, what do you think would have been the, the result of that? I would have solidified everything that he thought about people who he thinks look like me. And so all too often, we, we want to be right, but we don't do the right thing. And it's easy for someone to say, well, you were, you were a doormat in that situation. You shouldn't have taken that. You blah, blah, blah. And I'm not asking you to do things uh, the way that I do, but I want you to think about the things that you do do. And in which ways are you, are you, you know, being uh, narcissistic and thinking of yourself as a doormat? You want to be the martyr for your cause. And at what point do you become a bridge to help someone get someplace? My name is Andre Cohen, and this is our diversity talk for today. Have a great one. Bye. Yeah.
The way you think impacts the way you live. Now, let's talk about how you think and, and why you think, and let's explore the mind, all right? So there are three parts to your mind. There is the conscious, the subconscious, and the creative subconscious. Now, the conscious's mind is to absorb or take in all the information that it can. All right. And how do we typically take in information? We take that information in through our five senses, uh, touching, feeling, smelling, tasting. Right. Those are our five senses that we use to take in information. Now, once that information is taken in, it gets stored in our subconscious, sub meaning under, right? Submarine, submariner. Um, so our subconscious is the conscious thoughts that we have that we're not readily aware of. And so our conscious thoughts get get recorded into our subconscious and then they get acted on by our creative subconscious. Now, I know that's a lot, but so we'll go through an example of, of each of those. So in our, um, our, our conscious mind, we are aware of uh, the environment, right? And so all of that information gets uh, translated from our conscious mind through what we call our social lenses. Because I'm a man, I see the world in a particular kind of way. Because I'm African American, I, I see the world in a particular kind of way. And so all of the information that I'm getting from the environment around me goes through these social lenses which help to, to determine and dictate uh, what will be recorded in my subconscious. And so I never, and you never, actually record what is really going on. Um, you are recording what you uh, what you have gotten through your social lenses. And so uh, that, that conscious mind gathers that information, it goes through your, your social lenses, that gets written to your subconscious, and your subconscious stores all of the things that, you, um, that you've recorded, things that your parents have taught you, things you've learned from, uh, from teachers, from your friends, all of those things, uh, after going through your social lenses, get recorded onto your, um, your subconscious. And your creative subconscious at that point only plays what is in your subconscious. And so um, if we use a, a DVD as a, as a metaphor, that your conscious mind um, records all of the information, it gets written on the DVD, your subconscious, and then your creative subconscious is the DVD player. And the, the, the creative subconscious only plays what's on the DVD. And so if we, we carry that metaphor a little further, if um, I have the matrix in my DVD player, but I want to see Pooh's Big, Big Adventure, I want to watch the Pooh's Big Adventure movie, what do I have to do to change the movie that I'm watching? That's right. I have to take out the matrix and I put Pooh's Big Adventure into the DVD player and then I end up playing a different movie. Well, our mind is very much the same way, that we have written all of these things in our subconscious, and no matter how we try to do things differently, we always come back to doing the same thing, um, oftentimes saying that it's something new. And so what we, what we have to do is start to reprogram and re-initiate um, into our subconscious the kinds of things, the kinds of lifestyles, the kinds of thoughts, the kinds of um, attitudes that we want that will help propel us to our next level. And so all too often people try to uh, lose weight or they try to quit smoking by actually taking a hold of their behavior. They change their behavior, but what they haven't done is change their subconscious. And so we find ourselves taking the reins of our life and we adjust things and we, we do diets or we, um, we, we promise not to, to curse or to, to do other things. And we find that in a pinch, we come right back to that, that um, behavior that we swore we wouldn't do and we don't understand why. And it's because our mindset matters. And so uh, we'll take an opportunity to look at how do we start to um, rebuild or uh, reprogram our subconscious.
Seven at seven. Seven at seven. When I was seven years old, uh, I had this nightly routine that I had to undertake, which was our bedtime routine, right? And so at seven o'clock, my parents would line us all up. Um, I was the oldest, so I was the last one to, to, to go. And my mother would ask for three things from us. She wanted to make sure that we brushed our teeth, we washed behind our ears, and she gave us a big spoonful of cod liver oil. Now, I don't know about you, but cod liver oil was nasty. And so every night, seven at seven, we would do the same thing. We'd line up and she'd make sure that we washed behind our ears, that we had brushed our teeth, and she gave us a big spoon of cod liver oil. Now, let's fast forward 30 years. Before I go to bed, what do you think I do? I brush my teeth, I wash behind my ears, and I do not drink cod liver oil, all right? Um, but why do you think I, I, I do those things now? Because they were a routine when I was a, a kid, and now they are a habit. And all too often, people say, well, I, I need to change this habit, or I want to change that habit, there's something about myself that, that I need to change. And if you want to make that change last, you must start with a routine. So let's talk a little bit about what a habit is, and then we'll talk about what a routine is, all right? So a habit is something that you've learned to do, and it's become automatic. It's a learned pattern of behavior that has become automatic. Um, you don't, it's something you don't have to think about. Uh, driving, for example. Um, not very many of us think, let me step on the brakes when I see red lights, right? It's almost an automatic thing. And driving has gotten so automatic for me sometimes that when I get home, I don't even remember how I got home. I don't remember the journey between where I left and, and, and arriving home. Has that happened to you? Yeah right? Because it's become automatic. But how have those things become automatic? They have been a part of a routine. And so to have good habits, you must have good routines. So look, what is a routine? A routine is simply scheduling behaviors that are not automatic. And you continually schedule those predetermined, pre-assessed behaviors that will lead you to your goals. Another thing that people often will say is, um, I have a bad habit or I have a good habit. And I, I want to be clear about what it is that makes a bad habit or makes a good habit. A bad habit is any behavior that leads you away from your goal. That is a bad habit. And so sometimes people say, well, you know, I just can't quit smoking or, or I just can't stop, you know, eating this or I wish I could work out, you know, this way or that way. Part of the reason that you don't do those things is because not doing them gets you the reward that you want. And that if you started doing those behaviors, it might take away your reward. And so part of our, our motivation, part of the way that we need to think differently is we need to think about how do we start um, doing the things that are really important to us as opposed to the things that we're supposed to do. Oftentimes we get confused uh, with these two concepts, the truth and the facts, right? Um, and I would like to, to offer to you that the truth has no relationship to the facts. Yeah, I know many of you are like, what is this guy talking about? All right, so um, I had a teacher that I loved and adored. Her name was Mrs. Young. And I love Mrs. Young for three reasons. One, she drove a tangerine orange Corvette, which was hot. Um, and she also had green hair. Um, and she was too young to be a punk rocker, so it must have been an old lady die job gone bad. But one day I, 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 um, I, I saw Mrs. Young in her tangerine orange Corvette, and I was like, oh, that's super hot, right? And so Mrs. Young, uh, I, I appreciated her and I loved her uh, for, for those two reasons. But the third reason was, was simply this, that I felt like she cared about me as a person, like she wanted the best for me. And so one day I took a test in her class, and this was one of the questions on the test. How many planets are there in the solar system? And in 1982, what was my answer? Nine. If I were to ask a sixth grader today how many planets there were in the classroom, what answers might I get? Possibly eight, maybe seven, right? Or maybe even nine. But why the discrepancy? Because the facts have changed. Now, in 1982, there were nine planets. In, in today's world, there are, you know, any number of planets. But why is that? 
because uh, planet Pluto is um, under some kind of discrepancy. Some people say it's a planet, some people say it's not a planet, but um, it, it seems to be under some controversy. Now, how is it possible that for thousands of years there were nine planets, documented nine planets, and all of a sudden there is controversy as to if there are nine or eight or even seven planets? The truth? So let's look at what the truth is. The truth simply is what you know now. What you know about yourself, what you know about the environment you're, you're, you, you find yourselves in. Now, I know many of you are talking, you know, thinking, well, there's the absolute truth and there, you know, the, 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 the universe does its thing. I, I'm not necessarily talking about that stuff right now. But I do want you to, to think about who is it that got to determine what the truth was? Who determined what the facts were? Scientists. And scientists are who? They're people, just like you and I. So if scientists get to determine what the truth is for us, who gets to determine the truth for us? Who should be determining the truth for us? Now, I remember um, growing up, I, um, I, you know, when it's time to go to school, I, uh, this big yellow thing pulled up and, and I got on and it took me to a place called school. Come to find out later that uh, apparently I was in a special program called Head Start. Now, Head Start is a very interesting program because it is supposed to be for those people in poverty those poor people who want to give their children a, a, a leg up or, or um, an opportunity to meet, meet the grade level and meet the achievement level of their, uh, of their counterparts. But the thing that I thought was very interesting was that the, the facts in my family were that we did not have a lot of money. The facts were that we were, uh, could be considered poor. The facts were that my, uh, my parents were struggling college students trying to make a life out of um, the, the limited resources that they had um, exposed to them. Those were the facts. The truths were supposed to be that we would stay poor, that, um, that I would have a limited educational experience, that my, my, um, my environment, the, the neighborhood that I grew up in should have been the dictator of my destiny. But in our house, we had a different truth. We established the truth. Because although we didn't have a lot of money, we had a lot of love. And I know some of you are, are cracking up about that or you think that's pretty hokey. But I want to tell you that it's that love and that attention and that caring that my parents and my grandparents gave us that carried us through these storms. Because we got to determine what our truth is. The neighborhoods that we come from, the, the backgrounds that we have, the, the parents even that we've been given do not have to determine what our truths are. Sometimes we get so caught up with the facts that we can't see or determine our own truths. Does your profession require continuing education? Tired of overpaying for less than great seminars? Are you ready for education on your terms? It might be time to enroll at organizationallift.org, the key source for continuing education credits, ethics, and elimination of bias credits. Each of our courses will contain a clear syllabus, readings, media, games, and exam questions. High standards. You'll be required to pass the course at 90% or better. At the end of the course, you'll be awarded with a certificate that will serve as course documentation Courses range from $125 for one session course to $350 for a multi-session course. Andre Cohen is the Chief Facilitator for OrganizationalLift.org, and as such, he provides 24 hours availability to courses focused on developing cross-cultural competence, effective conflict mitigation, and practical methods for increasing discretionary effort. So join us at OrganizationalLift.org 
and experience what higher learning should be. Organizationallift.org. I just want to say thank you for joining us here at AM Horizons Training Group. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us and you can reach me at Andre at amhorizons.com or you can um, give us a call at 651-998-9376. We look forward to helping you nurture your seeds of change.